title of our sermon, Respond to God. One of the most interesting things in the Bible is to notice how different individuals to God and to God's truth. As you look through the Scriptures, you'll find that some responded to God and His truth in a positive manner, and some responded in a negative manner. But it's not only an interesting fact to see how people responded, it's not only fascinating to look at that. There's also something we can learn from this. We can learn how we ought to respond to Jesus and His truth. We find in the Bible in Acts 2.41, as we noted, there are some who responded in a beautiful way. Acts 2.41 They that gladly received His Word were baptized. And the same day they read in them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2 verse number 41. But then we look in Acts 13.46 Here's some individuals, they heard God's truth. And as they were hearing it, the way they responded, they started to contradict and to blaspheme. Acts 13.46 Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the Word of God should first be spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Some people responded in this manner. Some people just try to play around with religion. Not really get involved. Just kind of play around with it. What's fascinating is the way that people responded in the Bible, that's the same way people respond today. We must understand in our culture, you cannot be neutral on this matter and please God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You can't be neutral. Jesus has first place in your life, or He has no place. Jesus will not tolerate a divided allegiance. We cannot simply play around with religion and please God. Let us notice some examples in the Bible of responses to Jesus and His truth and see what we can learn. Hope you brought your, uh, have your Bible handy today. Look in Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look in the book of Matthew today. Matthew chapter 16. Begin in verse number 13. Matthew 16, verse number 13. Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? They answered and said to Him, Some say, You're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus answered and said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Then Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. Verse number 17, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon of Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I want you to notice the way this individual responded to Jesus. In verse number 13, Matthew 16, verse number 13, Jesus comes there to Caesarea Philippi, and He asked this question. Who do the people of the world say I am? What's the opinion from others about my identity? What are people saying? Who do people believe that I really am? In verse number 14, they said, in answer to this question, some say you're John the Baptist. Well, that was his cousin. Why would anybody think Jesus was John the Baptist? John came to prepare the way for Christ. Why would anybody think Jesus is John the Baptizer? Go back to chapter 14, verse number 1. Matthew 14, verse 1. In those days we read about Herod the Tetrarch ruler of the Jews, and he heard of the fame of Jesus. Matthew 14, verse 2, and he said, This is John the Baptist, risen from the dead, and therefore do mighty works show themselves forth in him. This is the one who had John killed. This is the one who had John the baptizer beheaded. And when he hears about all these wonderful miracles that Jesus is doing, in Matthew 14, verse number 1, and verse number 2, Matthew 14, he said, I know who it is. It's the guy I put to death. It's John. And all these wonderful miracles they're doing, showing forth themselves in Him, that's really John the Baptist risen from the dead. Go back to Matthew 16, 14. Matthew 16, 14. Some say thou art John the Baptist. There's the answer of a guilty conscience who had an innocent man put to death. because he didn't have the nerve to stand against some women. That's his response. Others say you're Elias. Now that's the Greek word for the Hebrew word Elijah. Some say you're Elijah. Well, why would anybody think Jesus was Elijah? He hadn't lived for hundreds of years. You will go back in your Old Testament to Malachi chapter 4 and verse number 5. One of the last promises God made to the Jewish people was He would send Elijah. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5. So when Jesus starts doing all these miracles, some of them said, well, that's fulfillment of Malachi 4 and 5. God sent Elijah. He's raised Elijah from the dead and he's doing all these miracles. Fortunately, Jesus explained for us in Matthew eleven fourteen what this passage meant. It didn't mean God was going to raise Elijah from the dead and send him back to earth. It was talking about John the baptizer. Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 11 through 14. Jesus explained the Elijah that this passage is talking about in Malachi 4 or 5 
was none other than John the baptizer. Jesus explained it. And the disciples finally understood that he was saying, John the Baptist is Elijah that was to come. Luke 1, 17 and following, Luke explained it for us really clearly. What the passage meant in Malachi 4, verse 5, was not that God was going to raise up Elijah from the dead, but that someone would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And that was John the baptizer. He would come in the spirit and power of Elijah and prepare the way for Christ. So you see, there was a lot of different answers about who Jesus really, who Jesus really is, what's His true identity, just like there's many answers today. The Muslims say He was a prophet, but not the Son of God. Same thing the Jewish people say today. Oh yeah, he was a prophet, but not the Son of God. Some people say he just deceived people that he was a false prophet. All kind of different answers about who Jesus is, even today. In Matthew 16, 14, some people thought he was... Jeremiah, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, the fiery prophet that God sent in the Old Testament. Some, because of the way Jesus preached, they says this must be Jeremiah. In Luke chapter 9, verse 19, Matthew 16, 14 says, or one of the prophets explains this clearly that what they thought was Jesus was one of the Old Testament prophets that had been raised from the dead. A lot of misunderstanding about who Jesus is and there's a lot of misunderstanding today. Even in what is called Christianity. Even His disciples misunderstood Him Acts 1 verse 6. They didn't understand. Even after He was resurrected, they said to Him in Acts 1 verse 6, Lord, will You at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking that He's going to set up some kind of a physical kingdom. Acts chapter 1 verse number 6. Misunderstanding. Some say you're uh, one of the prophets. And then Jesus said in verse 15, Matthew 16, verse number 15, Jesus said, who do you say? Who do you say? You know, there comes a time in everyone's life when they need to take a stand. There comes a time in everyone's life when they need to really make a commitment. Maybe this is the time in the life of these men because Jesus, that's what He's asking for. you got all these different answers, all these different religious opinions. Who do you say? Verse 16. Matthew 16, verse 16. Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. That's the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. That's the one that God promised all through the Old Testament He was going to send to save us from our sins. Peter understood that's who Jesus really was, and he said, You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. The day the church began in Acts 2, verse 36, Peter stood up and preached and he said, That same Jesus whom you have crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ, Messiah. So in Matthew 16, 16, 
Peter took a stand and said, You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. He wasn't ashamed that he believed in Jesus. Are you ashamed around some folks that you believe in Jesus? Are you, are you ashamed for some people to know that you're a Christian? Because they're so ungodly and vile. Are you, are you ashamed to let them know what you really are supposed to be standing for? Mark 8, 38. Mark made it clear as he quoted the words of Jesus, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes with his holy angels. One day Jesus is coming back to this world. He's going to judge this world. And let me tell you something. You've been ashamed of Jesus while you live down here. When He comes back, He's going to be ashamed of you. And you ain't going to be worried about what your friends think right then. You're not going to be worried about how popular you are. You're not going to be concerned about what this friend thinks or this friend thinks or what your mama thinks or your daddy thinks. All you're going to care when Jesus comes back is what the Lord thinks of you. That's all you're going to be concerned about. And he said, you've been ashamed of me and my words in this sinful generation. When I come back, I'll be ashamed of you. 2 Timothy 1 verse 18. 2 Timothy 1 verse 18 the apostle Paul said to a young gospel preacher be thou not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord nor of me his prisoner but be partaker of the afflictions of the gospel if you stand up for Jesus like you ought to in this sinful world you will be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel Matthew 27, verse 11. Matthew 27, verse 11. Jesus Christ is brought before Governor Pilate. The governor has the greatest opportunity of a lifetime to sit down and talk with the Son of God. How many people had that opportunity? Not many. He got it. Now how did he respond? After he had talked to Jesus for a while in Matthew 27, 11 and following, he was persuaded that he was innocent, that he hadn't done anything worthy of death. And he tries to persuade this Jewish crowd here that Jesus is innocent. And he realizes that they had delivered Jesus because of envy. That's often what motivates us. The things that come out of our mouth that are ungodly. It's usually because we're motivated by envy. These people are motivated by envy. That's why they brought Jesus to Him to begin with. He understood that. His custom was to release a prisoner to Him that, uh, during the feast. He says, now, i got this man named Barabbas, a murderer and a thief. Really good in the community. I got this man here named Barabbas and I got Christ. Which one you want to release to you? They said, give us Barabbas. Boy, they're really concerned about their children and their community, aren't they? They want a murderer released back in their community instead of Jesus. That's how much they hated Him. They said, give us Barabbas. He said, what am I going to do with Jesus then, which is called the Christ? They said, let him be crucified. Why? What evil has he done? Pilate knew he was innocent. The Jews kept on making a turmoil. They were determined. They were obstinate. They were going to have Jesus killed. And finally, 
Pilate takes out a little bowl of water and washes his hands and says, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And he gave them Barabbas and he delivered Jesus to be crucified. How did Pilate respond? He gave in to the crowd. Even though he knew the crowd was wrong. Even though he knew Jesus was innocent. He gave in. You give in to the crowd? Young people, do you, does the crowd influence you to do things you know is not right, but you do it just to please them? You give in to the crowd? That's what Pilate, that's his response to Jesus, just give in. 1 Corinthians 15.33 still says, Evil companions corrupt good morals. John 12, 42 and 43, There were many among the chief rulers of the, G of the Jews who believed in Jesus, but they would not confess His name, lest they should be thrown out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 12, 42 and 43, They wanted to do what the crowd said. Is that what you want to do? That crowd will take you right into hell. And you'll stand before Jesus on your own. Your little friends won't be there. In Matthew 14, you remember Herod? He had John put in prison. This lady danced before him and pleased him. He says, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. She went to her mama, and her mama said, get the head of John the Baptist. Because he had offended her. So she goes back and said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a big platter out here. It says in verse 9, Herod was very sorrowful. But because of the oath he had made to this wonderful woman, and because of those who sat with him at meat, he gave the order, behead John the Baptist, one of the greatest men that's ever lived. When he looked around at the crowd and he knew he had made this oath, he couldn't stand against the crowd and he said, Go execute him. Even though he was sorrowful to do it. Pilate gave up Jesus and was sorry to do it because others influence. Are others influencing you to do what is wrong? I talked to a lady one time and she said, What do I have to do to have my sins forgiven? I said, Open up your Bible here. We looked at Acts 2 verse 38 where it says you must repent and be baptized to be saved. She said, that's not what my mama taught. And my mama never obeyed that and I know she's in heaven. She says, I, I just don't believe that verse of Scripture. That's how she responded to God's truth. How do you respond to it? Respond in the right way right now while we stand.